if you'd open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Vanuatu. Now, if you don't know where it is, how many of you have one of these things in your pocket or in your purse? Almost everybody. If you will put a, an app on it called Google Earth and type Port Vila, Vanuatu, it'll take you there. If you will type Grace Baptist School, Port Vila, it'll take you right down on top of our buildings. If you expect to see the street view, sorry, <laughs> I don't think that little Google car has four-wheel drive. There are no paved roads where we live. Certainly out to the school when it rains, it's wet. Luke chapter 14 describes the marriage supper. Jesus has gone and is having a meal. As he's having that meal, he teaches. And we'll start reading in verse 16. So then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. And said one unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his master these things, and when the master of the house being angry, said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the lame, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And now the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the privilege you give us to meet together and to worship. Father, as we look into your word this morning, we ask that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, that we might see the world as you see it. And we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' day, people wore sandals. They had dirty feet. And I suppose if I was going to put a title on this message, it would be Dusty Shoes, Dirty Feet. If you were to come visit me in Port Vila, we have the, in the city itself has some concrete footpaths. But you better be walking, looking down all the time, or you're going to step into a hole or where the concrete has broken or something's grown through it. And once you leave the center of town, you're going to find that there's no such thing as a footprint. And the road, the worst county road in Texas. Now, most of you guys see a lot of four-wheel drive vehicles in this community. I drive one. If I'm fortunate, I will only put that vehicle into four-wheel drive once this year. In Vanuatu, my, my truck lives in four-wheel drive. The roads are bad. You get out and you walk, and they're dirty. Now, here I wear boots. There I wear rubber sandals, rubber shoes, sandals. My feet are dirty all the time. And there's a point to all of this. When Jesus went to that marriage feast, There was not a servant there to wash their feet. When you come in, there's somebody there to wash your feet. That was part of the job, part of the host's work. 
to clean the dust of the feet off, off the road. Just common courtesy. Life in Vanuatu is very much like what it was in Jesus' day. You come, you go, I go visiting, we walk up a, well, you saw one of the hills, we walk up to my house. Uh, that's about 400, it doesn't, that's only halfway. They gave us that house, and Lynn was excited. They, that piece of property where that house is also has the site of the original church in Malakula, where the Anglican missionaries came in the early part of the 19th century and established a church. They dedicated that piece of ground. The church is long gone. The missionaries are long gone. And now that property is mine. And the reason it is is because we're going to build a church there, aren't you? And yes, we are. And we'll compel folk to come in. It's our job as missionaries. It's our job as Christians to get out where we're going to rub shoulders with folk that we don't want to rub shoulders with. Uh, You saw our folk walking on a dirty road in bare feet, carrying all those containers. They're going to walk four hours to fill those containers with water and walk back. That's what they're going to cook and cook with and drink. If they want more, they're going to walk back and forth. Life's hard. If they have a choice with water to drink or water to wash with, what do you think they're going to choose? So sometimes going visiting can be a really aromatic experience. Getting on a, a small, in a small vehicle with some folk, it can be pretty pungent inside. And you say, who like, you know, you don't like sit to people, you don't really enjoy that, do you? But God tells us to get out where people are. We can't catch, you don't go fishing in a bucket. And we don't find souls that need it here, where the carpet's clean. The only way to avoid getting your feet dirty in Vanuatu is just never leave the house. Because once you step out of the house, I have tile floors. I couldn't. Carpet would rot. It's wet. This is winter weather outside for us. It'll be about 90 degrees, 85 to 90, that's in the winter. The humidity goes down. It goes down to 50%. In the summertime, it still might be 95 to 105, but the humidity will also be 95 to 105. You don't think 105% humidity, you can't imagine. The difference in whether the dew comes from the temperature on the top of the leaf and what's underneath. So you can sit in the sun, bright sun and watch the water drip off the banana leaves. It's never muggy. You guys in West Texas, it's never muggy out here anyway. Is it? Yeah, it's hot and it's dry and it's never green. Well, I guess maybe it is green if you irrigate. But look, we're going to make this application. You're, I tell you these stories and you smile, but... If we're not out rubbing shoulders with people that are unpleasant. You know, I've come back and America has changed a lot. Young people tattoo themselves from their wrist to their shoulder. And I find that really puzzling. They poke a whole bunch of holes in their ears and their tongues. And, you know, I watch that in Fiji. They st- Stick it right through from one side to the other, but they're worshiping some Hindu god when they do that. Our kids are just showing off. And us old guys with gray hair, we don't like that very much, do we? And we don't really understand why. And that makes us not really willing to share with them 
the message that they need the most. That Jesus died for you. He took his place on the cross, your place on the cross of Calvary, that you might have life everlasting. But we withhold, you know, it's we're out of our comfort zone then. And Jesus spent his whole life making people uncomfortable. And I'm probably going to spend the next 20 minutes making some of you uncomfortable. That's what missionaries do. You know? It's just that piss. They're scattered from an, an island we call a Nijim in the south, all the way to the Torres Islands in the north, 1,800 miles north to south, 83 islands. God privileged us to start the very first Baptist church in this country. When we went, there were no Baptist churches. There are a handful now on three different islands. God's blessed. But three out of 80, you could all, I could put you on each, there's on a different island, and you could be first. Think about that. Lay a foundation. God tells us to go into all the world. That's our mission. He says, go into the highways and the hedges. He begins by saying, come, everything is ready. Everything that you need, that I need, has already been done. The death of Jesus on the cross, our personal acceptance of that death on our behalf, allowed the Holy Spirit of God to indwell us, to empower us, and to equip us to do anything he asks us to do. All he asks of us is a willingness to do it, to step up and say, yep, here I am. What happens next is his problem, not yours. Almost 50 years ago, I stood in front of a, in front of a church. I'd answered an invitation. I'd been through three campaigns in Vietnam. I'd received Christ as my Savior there. And I came into the Lanakila Baptist Church. It was a brand new experience for me to be in a Baptist church. Preachers, I'd been baptized, and sat under the ministry for about six months. We had a missions conference. Our missions director at that time was Dr. Jack Bridges. He preached. We had an old man there. Uh, J. Arthur Mao, who'd taken, he was in what was called uh, West Papua today, Borneo used to be, took the gospel to a bunch of headhunters, sang as his invitation, you know, carry the light. And throw out the lifeline. And I answered. And I came down and stood And a man did, and I looked over, my wife had come too, and I wonder, you know, about 10, 12 of us answered that invitation. What on earth is going on? She's there, I'm here, and I prayed just a simple prayer that morning. Lord, I don't know what's going on, but here I am. You just take me and use me however you want me, to, whatever you want me to do. Boy, it's been a ride ever since. It really has. God has privileged us to serve on three different mission fields. See churches started, see Bible colleges started. But none of that's my problem. The only decision I made that counted was the one to say, Lord, here I am. 
after my salvation, just two decisions. God, I want you as my Savior, and God, I'm yours. And if you read Acts chapter 9, you'll find that that's just exactly what Paul did. He said, Lord, he recognized Jesus as his Lord, and then he asked that question that maybe some of you have never asked. And I will expect you to ask him that question before we leave. Lord, what would you have me do? Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, send me. Pretty much the same question, same response to the Lordship of Christ in our lives. And that comes with salvation. That's not something that comes after. He saves you, you're his. He paid for you, you're his. It's not a matter of no negotiation. He bought you. Now, we're good servants or we're poor servants, but we're servants nonetheless. Good ones or poor ones. What do we do? How does he work with us? He sends us just like he sent God the Father sent his son. Hmm? Jesus told his disciples, even as the Father has sent me into the world, even so send I you. And it's just a willingness. Whether you go to the mission field or you go across the street, you're a sent one. Jesus was a sent one. Is he going to send you? Most folk never ask that question because they really don't want to know the answer. If they did, they'd ask. And if you really want to know, ask and he'll tell you, and you won't be confused about it. You won't meet a preacher at the, as I did. I listened to Knutson preach the first time before I went overseas, thanked him for the service, and thought, my goodness, I'm glad this is the last time I get to hear him. You know? He made me profoundly uncomfortable. And I thanked him anyway and smiled, and you know what? He knew I was lying my face off. You think about that. He gave him a message. That message was to go where the people need you. The Lord said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, and bring in the hither, the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Those in our society that don't look like they would be really make good church members. And I was saved in a church of soldiers, sailors, and marines. And most of us did not look like we would make really good church members. We had a skill set that nobody wanted. They had taught us to do things that really weren't applicable to civilized society. And we may have done people, you know. I have been thanked more in the last, for my service in the last five years than ever. I came back from Vietnam. It was not, oh, thank you for going. We were called all manner of things. Because we made people uncomfortable. But somebody cared enough to come tell me, in spite of my uh, obvious personality defects, I still fuss with it. I don't like crowds. I don't like loud noises. I don't sleep good. Somebody cared enough to see through all of that that you put up to keep people away from you to tell me about Jesus. And he saved me. He changed me. And he's managed to use me one way or the other for the last 40 years. And keep my loving wife with me for 50. We celebrated 40 years as a missionary this year, and we celebrated 50 years of marriage this year. 
God's good. Because somebody took God's command to go and brought it to Steve's board. They didn't find me in the temple because I didn't like the church. Okay? I didn't grow up in a family full of church-growing people. So God didn't find me. They didn't send somebody into the church, and certainly not into the Society of Angels, because I want you to know that if I were going to describe um, a ship full of sailors, it wouldn't be angels. You know, God, you, he sends us into the highways and hedges. We go places that nobody else wants to. We're not in a place where there are teeming millions of people. And I was in the conference here not so long ago with a guy who was ministering in Manila, a city of 22 million people. And they'd had a service, and he had his presentation. I mean, he had thousands of people under one roof. And thousands of folk receiving Christ as their Savior. And the missionary jealousy comes in. Why can't that happen? And then I thought, and God, he's in a city of 22 million people. He had 2,000 people. That's 0.01%. You're in a city of 35,000. When you get 400, 450 people under one roof, that's more than 1%. Oh. Oh. Well, maybe we're not doing so bad after all. But it's all in, we're doing what God asks us to do, and God takes care of that increase. He tells us, I've done everything you said. Now I'll go into the highways and hedges in the Pacific Basin. There are 25 different island groups, thousands of islands, thousands. Some with just a handful of people. They're going to live their whole lives without Jesus Christ. They're never going to hear about him. And they're going to die and go to a devil's hell. That's the simple answer. It's not pleasant, but that's the way it's going to be. Unless somebody tells them. Unless somebody goes. Unless they hear. We are sent into a sin-sick sin-marred world with the only message that matters. Jesus Christ saves sinners. I think sometimes here in the United States, as blessed as we are, we forget just how blessed we are. And we become satisfied with the community of believers that we're associated with. We like being around our church family. And if we're not careful, we develop a, an attitude that says, this is ours if someone different comes in. They look different. Maybe they smell different. You know, we have dress codes. and I kind of like to dress up. When folk visit our church for the first time, I'm just glad they have clothes on. You're laughing, but some folk don't wear clothes. And they still turn up sometimes. you don't send them away. They've come where they can actually hear the message of life that, no, that never finishes. I'm almost speaking, almost lost it and you almost heard me speak it in tongues. Because we talk about eternal life, we say life when no sabe finish, sometime. Life that begins in a place and never ends. 
that's the message that you've got in your... If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, that's the message you have. It's the only message that will change your world. That's Sweetwater. Now, I look, around, I look back there at all those mission letters. You're changing the world around the world. You're changing, you have a part in changing people's lives. I read in the bulletin where you, to date you've had 28 saved and how many baptized. And then I look down there, your missionaries, over 1,000 people, in the first six months of 2018 have received Jesus Christ. And you guys have had a part in that. And that's something to really praise God about. See, but you got to get out and walk those dusty roads that Jesus walked where you're, you're going to get your feet dirty. It's going to make you uncomfortable. Might prick your heart. Might disgust you. Might even make you angry. How can people live like that? Don't they know better? The short answer is no, they don't. And the reason they don't is because no one's told them there's a better way. When we witness, I make no assumptions about, I can use the word God, they have a word God, but it might be a stone that's sitting in the center of the village or a post that once a year they'll put pig blood on. I can't assume that they're going to know any of the gospel stories or that when I say Jesus died for you, well, so what? What's that mean? As I witness in America, you know what? If they're 30 years of age and younger, they probably don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. They might have grown up in church, and, but chances are they didn't. Folk, God's not done with you. We started the First Baptist Church in Vanuatu. I was 50 years old. I'll be 70 this year. I don't reckon God's done with me yet. I got off an airplane and we didn't know anyone. They speak 103 languages there. I kind of spoke one of them. I kind of spoke English. I still just kind of speak English. And you people don't speak English. You speak American, and that's a very different language. So we've learned to speak French. We've learned to speak Bislama, which is the pidgin, and parts of three other island village languages. God's not done with you. You live in a community where it might be good to be bilingual. Nothing wrong with that. Pretty hard to witness to somebody if you can't speak there. You expect them to learn your language so you can witness to them. Huh? That's a problem. I said I was going to make some of you uncomfortable. I don't apologize for that. God has spent, what, 46 years of my life making me uncomfortable all the time. And the way he makes me uncomfortable is he challenges me into serving him day by day. And I hear the message that says, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be full. Some of you have been here long enough that you remember when this house was full to capacity. And you bemoan the fact that it's not full. And we make excuses just as these guys did in the beginning. Come, everything's ready. 
Well, first, I bought some ground. Remember, this is supper time. I don't know about you, but I wait till the sun starts going down before I eat supper. I bought some ground. I'm going to go look at the ground in the dark. Wait a minute. I bought five, I bought ten oxen I'm going to use to plow those fields. I'm going to go check them out in the dark. Now, when we got married, I was working on a dairy farm. Now, I did go out in the dark to bring the cows in. When the sun came up, often he put me on a plow behind a tractor. And I could almost plow a straight line with a tractor in the daylight. And if you want to try to plow in the dark, you can. But when the sun comes up, you find out that maybe you didn't do as good a job as you thought you would. Because you pick out that landmark in the dark and you almost don't see it. And when the sun comes up, you find out, oh, nuts. Time to do it over. It's just an excuse. I've got married. Good for you. I can't. What he's really saying is I have responsibilities that I'm going to put in front of what you want me to do. And how did the master respond? It says he was angry. That's a problem. I don't want to, I don't want to meet an angry God. Do you? I want to meet one that says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my Lord. I don't know how long, I don't know when that's going to be. You guys with gray hair, God's not done. Sometimes we get, we, I'm tired. I wake up, my bones hurt, I'm tired. Don't want to do this anymore. God's not done with you. I'm just about done with you, though. God sends us with a miracle of salvation. God has divine appointments for you. He's not done with you. Out there somewhere, there's someone waiting on you to tell them about Jesus Christ. Not the church. There's someone out there waiting on you to tell them Jesus saves. There's someone out there that needs your help to show a little kindness so that you can tell them that Jesus saves. Maybe there's someone who needs a handout to show you the love of Christ, to see the love of Christ through you. But there are divine appointments in all our lives. We either keep them or we don't. We either allow God to use us or we don't. There's really no middle ground. We either a good servant. That servant didn't argue with, you know, that's one of the things you need to read as you read that parable. That servant was absolutely obedient 100% of the time. So I went and talked to all those guys. They didn't want to come. I'm done now. No, go into the highways, one of the cities, lanes, bring in all those no hopers. I've done that. I'm finished now. He didn't say that. He said, now, get out into the highways and hedges. Find some more. And compel them. That's a really interesting word. Compel. It means to bring by any means necessary. It means to constrain. If I can scare someone into salvation with a message on hell, that's what I'll preach. 
if it takes me on my knees begging them to come. That's what I'll do. Can't let pride. I mean, he's talking to someone, I think, my goodness. What kind of an example will that individual be? Well, he'll be a trophy of God's grace, or she will. It's what we're here for. If you're here this morning and you're without Jesus Christ as your Savior, the next few words are for you. Jesus died for you. You can accept him or reject him. That is your choice. It doesn't change the fact that he died for you. It also doesn't change the fact that based on the decision you're likely to make this morning will determine where you spend eternity because you may never have another opportunity to receive him as your savior. I'm glad I took mine. I've never regretted it. I've watched others say no. In the 20 years we've been in Vanuatu, I've buried quite a number of them. And there is nothing that compares to a Nivan funeral. You heard them. That they don't pay mourners. It's not like the Middle East where they hire a bunch of people. They'll cry, and you heard them. And I turned the volume way down on that video. I've had them try to bring the corpse out of the, out of the coffin. That all happens in 48 hours. Funerals are not long drawn out places. We don't have places to keep our dead, we bury them. When someone dies, they enter into, into eternity. That happens weekly for us. So maybe I'm, uh, you never get hard to it. You just don't, because you know someone. I think the West we do, because it takes a long time. Someone dies, they go to the mortuary. Maybe we have a funeral within the week, if we can get all the, if we can get all the family in. Maybe not. And we're so stoic. as a nation, that we lose sight of what it means to go into eternity. If you're sitting here without Jesus Christ, eternity is a heartbeat away. Just a heartbeat. Where will you go should you not make it out the door? Christian, are you keeping the appointments that God has made for you? He has some. We just open our eyes and be aware of them. Take advantage of them. If you're not, we say, I don't see any. Well, you need to come forward when we give this invitation and ask God to open your eyes and soften your heart. Huh? This is what he wants. I'm not asking you to surrender to the mission field, but I am asking you to surrender. Whether you're 15 years old or 75, the surrender, the principle is the same. And it's over and over and over again, okay? That's what Paul says, when I die daily. We put aside those things which we want to do and do those things he wants us to do. And the more we do that, Pretty soon, they're the same thing. Because I want to do what God wants me to do. And I don't have to argue with him anymore. And life is so much easier. Let him have his way in your life this morning.